And moving on to the urgent oral question, Mr. Colin McGrath has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Executive Office. I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, they should raise continually in their places. The member who tabled the question will be called automatically to ask a supplementary. Clerk, please read the question. To ask the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, following their announcement on Thursday, the 10th of September, what support the Executive will provide to customers, workers, and businesses in area where, pardon me, areas where local restrictions have been announced, and there is a financial detriment as a result of these restrictions. Can I call the Deputy First Minister? Sorry, I've been advised to uh, call the Deputy First Minister. I call the First I Minister. Think, Apologies. I think there's a conspiracy going on here, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm one is quite concerned. Just about don't take that. it personally, all right. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, the local restrictions that were put in place last week were uh, a necessary and proportionate approach to address the increasing number of COVID cases that we have witnessed since early July and which have accelerated over this past week. If allowed to continue, this will inevitably lead to an increase in hospital admissions and deaths, something we cannot allow to happen. Let's be clear, rapidly rising rates of infections are not good for businesses and for employees. The executive is therefore bringing in restrictions now to try to slow and stop this worrying increase in cases. The new restrictions are focused on reducing contacts between people in household settings, which is viewed by the executive as the most effective way to reduce the interactions between people at this time. This is not a lockdown, so hospitality and other businesses will continue to operate, but subject to strict guidance, regulation and appropriate enforcement where necessary. The Executive has put a range of support measures in place for businesses to help deal with the impact of COVID-19 and will continue to explore ways of continuing support in the future. And I call Callum McGrath to ask supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the First and Deputy First Minister for their attendance and response. I mean, once again, as you've mentioned, Mr Speaker, it was TV where we heard about these matters and then we're having to troll NI Direct to try and find what the outcomes and actions are and just to continue to reiterate that it's not always a clear navigation through that website to find out what the regulations and the, the various uh, changes are. The public are rightly concerned about what they can and cannot do. And these restrictions, which came quite quickly uh, and for the right reasons, have resulted in changes in specific postcodes. And that has added and fueled to the concerns that people have. But given that the message includes suggestions of only travelling when necessary, uh, and some of those places have businesses that are already badly impacted from the original uh, implications of COVID. I suppose it would be good to know if you will introduce any additional specific help for those businesses, for those city centres, for those town centres that will be impacted with the lower footfall as a result of the new recommendations. Thank you. Thank the Chair of the Committee. Uh, for his question today. Can I, first of all, Mr Speaker, address the issue which you have raised uh, rightly? Um, the Deputy First Minister and I, at the beginning of COVID-19, felt that the Department of Health, in particular the Minister of Health, had a heavy burden in relation to a lot of the health regulations. And we offered up, not sure whether they were delighted about it or not, the two junior ministers to help navigate uh, the health regulations through this House. Given the pressures that are now on TEO around a number of issues, including high street task forces and other issues that we're involved in, uh, we've decided the time is now right to allow the health minister to bring the health regulations to the floor of this chamber. So from now on, changes to the coronavirus regulations will be led by the Department of Health. Why did we do that? Because often uh, we had to get briefing from the Department of Health to the Executive Office, and that was slowing the response down, and we didn't think that that was the best use of time. Uh, so that is one of the reasons, and we do apologise, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, that you felt there was a need uh, to make your statement today, but that is one of the reasons why uh, today uh, we find ourselves in a sort of a handover situation with the regulation. So I just wanted to make that point so people uh, were clear around that. In terms of, of the restrictions, uh, we received a very full uh, briefing from the Chief Medical Officer. Yes, I know, uh, uh, Mr Chairman, that some people 
were uh, rightly surprised by what uh, the level was in, in some of these areas. But if you look at Belfast City Council area, uh, some of the areas in Ballymena, some of the areas in Lisburn, uh, we were now looking at uh, over 80 cases per 100,000 in terms of COVID-19. When you look at other areas of Northern Ireland, it's as low as 10 and 11. So that is why we decided that we needed to intervene in those postcode areas of concern. And I know that some people in those areas feel um, that we should have put it right across Northern Ireland, but that would not have reflected the, the uh, danger that we felt some of those postcode areas were in. And that is why we took the decision to put what is, uh, I think, the House will accept a minimum intervention at this stage, and we hope it works, and we will review it in two weeks' time. And if it hasn't had the desired impact, then we will have to revisit uh, these restrictions uh, again. It is a limited intervention. It doesn't impact on businesses at this stage. It's just about household contact. So whilst I understand uh, the member wanting to raise issues about support in the future. We are certainly keeping that under uh, review, and the Minister for Finance is engaging with his counterparts in Westminster because you may have seen that there has been an announcement of support for businesses that have to close for three weeks of, in the region of £1,000 to £1,500. We are looking at that. The Minister of Finance is looking at that and, and indeed speaking with the Minister of the Economy on this issue, so it is something that we will continue to monitor. I call George Robinson. Does the First Minister agree with me that the key challenge for the Executive is protecting lives from COVID, but at the same time seeking to ensure our economy can function as best as possible? And I think the member has summed up the challenge that lies ahead of us. We do want to protect the citizens of, of Northern Ireland, of course, from COVID-19 and to alert them to the dangers that are there. But at the same time, we want to effect a recovery for our economy, and, and therein lies the challenge. Uh, we have taken these limited intervention uh, rules so that uh, we can say to people that they need to be alert, they need to be aware in household settings, and we hope that that will stem the spread uh, of COVID-19 uh, in, in that way. So it, it is a balancing act. We acknowledge that. Uh, that's why the executive spends quite a considerable amount of time looking at the evidence that is presented to us and looking at the interventions we can take. And we make no apology for that, Mr Speaker, because it is right that we have all the evidence in front of us. I call Kiva Archibald. Um, Minister, the businesses and workers have faced a, a very difficult few months. Some haven't yet been able to reopen and some, although not yet, may be forced to close again due to restrictions being reimposed. The furlough scheme has been an absolute lifeline. So can I ask the Minister what representations um, executive ministers have made to the British Chancellor about extending the furlough scheme and also the self-employed income support scheme? Go ahead. Well, I thank the member for that question. Indeed, we have made representations in relation to the furlough scheme, both through our own party representations and indeed through the Minister of Finance, who uh, wrote to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, I think, two weeks ago now, saying that a cliff edge coming on furlough was going to cause a lot of hardship for a lot of people here in Northern Ireland. And we have uh, looked on with interest to the economic indicators that were put out today and the fact that Northern Ireland is very low in terms of economic recovery. Uh, those are stats that we look at very closely to see what it is that we need to do to try and assist the Northern Ireland economy. You know as well as I do that we have very much a public sector focused economy here uh, and uh, we need to try and make sure that the productivity of the Northern Ireland economy grows again in a sustainable way and that's one of the issues I'm sure the Minister for the Economy is looking at. But yes, we have made representations on the furlough scheme. This is not about closing businesses. Uh, this is just about household contacts at this present moment in time, and we hope that it is effective. But it is only effective if people work with us. I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, um, First Minister. Um, I was in the Holy Land this morning, um, part of my constituency, and there were 10, 12 young people standing in the front garden drinking away. Um, my specific question in terms of the announcements last week were, because we know that they're not socially distancing in, in that community, do you believe that the term avoid unnecessary travel relates to them in terms of them going home to their families at the weekend? And if so, can some further guidance be produced for the students? 
her for her question and declare an interest because I have two children uh, at university, <laughs> returning to university in the very near future. Um, look, we have a, an ongoing dialogue with Queen's University and the Ulster University at the moment. Uh, we're not advising that people shouldn't go home uh, at the weekend, but it's something that we're going to continue to work on uh, with the university, whether uh, we need to look at more online learning so that people can remain in their own homes as opposed to coming to Belfast. Um, but the published uh, guidance, uh, when it has, been, uh, it has been outlined on NI Direct, and when it comes to issues like travel, socialising outside the home, work, shopping, attending functions, People should use their discretion uh, and common sense and continue to work from home where they can. Um, so really ask yourself, uh, how important is the journey or, uh, or other planned activity and how much additional risk would we bring to others by going out uh, and engaging in that activity? How difficult is it going to be if we go to this activity to maintain social distancing? Uh, is there good hand hygiene being operated? Are people wearing masks? So it's about trying to strike the right balance at this early stage. It may be that we have to be more interventionist in the future, but we're trying to say to people at the moment, our evidence shows that it is around household contact, and that's why we've taken the measures that we have. I'm going to call Jim Allister. Um, Mr Speaker, you will know I'm not noted for my level of agreement with the uh, Member of Parliament for North Antrim. Indeed, maybe the First Minister could say the same. But... Uh, I must say, I do agree with his severe reservations on this issue. Uh, that he said, we have to learn to live with COVID. We can't kill our economy. And messages such as that are contradicted, I have to say, for a trading town like Balamina, when it is headlined as effectively a hot spot. Uh, you, know, you told us, First Minister, this didn't impact on business. Sorry, it does. When you pick out a town like Balamina and effectively headline it as a hotspot, then the footfall is affected. And hence the question, I think, from the original questioner. What are we going to do for those businesses which are now going to feel the draft on all of this? They've really suffered more than they can. I fear for their future now. I thank the member for his agreement with the member for North Antrim and uh, can I say to him in relation to that, we do have to learn to live with COVID. So I agree with the member for North Antrim as well. And we do need to protect our businesses and to grow the economy, but we also have to protect people's lives. So it is about livelihoods and lives. And I say that very sincerely, Mr Speaker, today, but as I've indicated, in uh, Great Britain and in England, uh, they are looking at a scheme whereby if businesses do have to close, that they can support them with a grant uh, of £1,000 to £1,500 if they're closed for a period of three weeks. I think that's something that we would support and we want to uh, hear what uh, we can do in relation to that and whether there will be Barnet consequentials uh, given our very tight uh, budgetary position. But also, uh, on a, a quadrilateral call with Scotland and Wales, uh, both of those jurisdictions have also raised the issue that if people have to self-isolate at home um, due to COVID being in the community and they have to stay at home, then what support is available there for those people that have to stay at home and not go to work? Because we do know that for some people, people on zero-hour contracts, issues like that, they won't have an income then if they do have to stay at home. So the Department for Communities uh, is looking at that issue. We already have a helpline to deal with uh, issues of, of severe stress. And again, Mr Speaker, there's no perfect answer to any of this, but we're trying to make sure that we put in place, if we do have to move uh, to closing businesses, and I very much hope that that is not the case. Can I call Jerry Carl? Uh, Mr. Speaker, thanks to the Minister for her answer so, uh, so far. Uh, follow my previous question and her previous answer about the evidence earlier today uh, that does exist to show that this virus uh, does spread rapidly in homes, requiring action, but seemingly doesn't spread uh, as rapid in schools and workplaces pl not requiring action. Will the Minister commit that this specific information will be made available to the members of the Health Committee and this House? 
Well, it's not for me to commit on that. It's for the, the, the Minister for Health, of course, and uh, he has provided us with this evidence. Um, the reason we talk about households is because everybody is quite relaxed when they're in a household, as you would expect. It's their home. Um, but when you're in a regulated environment, and I've had the chance to visit some schools to see how they are managing uh, COVID restrictions very well, uh, uh, has been the answer I have gained from visiting some of the schools. And of course, even in hospitality outlets, uh, there has been very good regulation there as well. It is a regulated environment. People are taking uh, precautions, and that is why we're saying in the household setting, uh, we're asking people to be alert and to stay safe in order to save lives. And I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Sir, uh, can I ask my right honourable friend the question that was tabled relates to business support? Uh, we have been discussing at the Economy Committee excluded groups. Now, I have been told that there are 30,000 of these, and if they were to be paid the minimum of £10,000 grant, that comes to a bill of £300 million. Is there anything like that available in the budget? Because ultimately, these interventions in the economy need to be paid for. Well, as, as a member knows, and as this House knows, we have been able to make a number of interventions, uh, both through our own interventions, through the Minister for the Economy, working with the rest of the Executive, and indeed uh, through UK schemes that we've been able to take advantage of, the furlough scheme, the self-employed scheme. I mean, the furlough scheme, if you look at that, for example, and the scale of the number of people from Northern Ireland that have been put on furlough, I think it was in the region of 211,000. There is no way, uh, Mr Speaker, that we would have had the financial wherewithal to support that scheme. We needed the Whitehall intervention to allow us to be able to furlough those people. And that's why we're appealing to Whitehall again to intervene, the Chancellor to intervene, so that we can have a tapering off of the furlough scheme. I think we all accept it will have to end. But the point is we're saying don't have a cliff edge in relation to furlough. In relation to excluded NI, I know there's a, a debate in this House tomorrow around excluded NI. And of course we would want to help our citizens who are, who are in difficulty and who haven't been able to gain from some of the schemes that we have put out there. But it is around the financial wherewithal to be able to do that and indeed identifying those people in a way that doesn't allow fraud and, and make sure that we get the money out to the people in need. So again, uh, I'm sure the Minister for the Economy will address some of those issues tomorrow, but it is about making sure that we have the finances available and not making promises that we can't then deliver on. Thank you. I call Martin Anderson. Go on, may I get, uh, Minister. It was very welcome today's announcement that the Infrastructure Minister will finally take the lead in providing a, a scheme for the transport sector. And as you know, that sector, particularly taxi drivers and others, have felt that it was like a game of ping pong between the Department of the Economy and the Department of Infrastructure. Um, and I would ask you that for those sectors in future, where there are two ministers engaged or involved, that um, help is provided so as to ensure that all the necessary assistance is put in place and they don't fall between two stools ever again. I thank the member for her question and she will know that the Deputy First Minister and I have intervened to direct that uh, the Minister of Infrastructure should take forward this scheme. It's disappointing that that scheme hasn't been put in place up until now, uh, and I think it's wrong uh, that that uh, sector in particular hasn't had the help and assistance that they have been looking for. Uh, indeed, we uh, have also intervened in the area of childcare, uh, so, and she will know that as well, ha having been to the Executive Committee and spoke about this. Again, that was a split between policy and regulation. Uh, and the difficulties that uh, pursued there as well. So we're trying to make sure that it's a whole of executive approach, and that's what it's about, trying to make sure that we identify the gaps in provision, and then if we can, to intervene and to assist. So I hope that that scheme uh, for taxis and for the haulage industry can come soon as quickly as possible. I call Justin McNulty. Thank you, First Minister, for coming to the House today, and thank you for your answers thus far. Um, pardon the oxymoron, First Minister, but why are your party happy to brief against other ministers in the executive with false facts? Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, um, since this executive returned, we have seen parties briefing out 
putting things up on Twitter after executive meetings. Uh, uh, there was the case on Thursday evening after the EU exit meeting where a full summary of the EU exit meeting uh, was given to the BBC uh, and that certainly didn't come from either the First Minister's party or the Deputy First Minister's party. Uh, so unfortunately we have leaks, uh, we have uh, some ministers who love to resort to Twitter, who love to brief Good Morning Ulster uh, and then the rest of us are, are left having to deal with those issues. I say this very sincerely, everybody should wise up. We're dealing with huge issues in the executive and uh, people should stop briefing against each other. We're supposed to be in a five party coalition dealing with all of these issues and that's what I hope we do moving forward from now. Thank you, Nicole. Stuart Dixon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, First Minister, for your answers uh, in this debate so far. Uh, I'll save your blushes over the little local difficulty, which I'm sure you're having with the Member of Parliament for East Antrim, and cut to the chase. Those that have been excluded in Northern Ireland have been failed by the Economy Minister and have been failed by um, her uh, comments where she says that the responsibility lies with the executive and not her uh, to provide appropriate funds for, for any schemes coming forward. Can the First Minister explain to this House why um, if, uh, if an excluded business was located in any of the English regions, Scotland or Wales, today they would not be excluded? Well, can I say to the member uh, again, I hardly think Sammy Wilson would ever be called a little local difficulty, and I will defend him on that to the very end. Um, but I, can I also say that in terms of uh, excluded NI, we are, of course, wanting to assist everyone who has had difficulties in relation to COVID-19. It's why we introduced a range of schemes. But by introducing a range of schemes, there are always those who fall through the gaps. And what we need to do now uh, is again on the furlough, on the uh, self-employed scheme, we have the backing of Westminster in having to deal with those. And can I also say to the member, because we do not have tax raising powers here in Northern Ireland, we do not have the data in relation to uh, those people who were newly self-employed. Um, that is the reality, and a member may not agree with it, but that is the reality. And the member uh, should know that the Minister for the Economy and indeed the Minister for Finance has tried to get that data uh, from Treasury, but without success. But look, the debate will take, for, take place tomorrow. Uh, I've no doubt we'll have a full uh, debate on those issues, but be assured we do want to help and assist where we can with our budget, but who we'll also lobby Westminster in relation to helping those who have been excluded. And I call Colin Gildernew. Gordon Mayagat, Con Corlea. Um, in light of the ongoing worry and rise in, in COVID positive cases and in the context of necessary restrictions which have, have had to be put in place, can I ask the Executive to confirm whether the Economy Minister intends to provide updated workplace health and safety guidance in order to mitigate against the spread of coronavirus within workplaces? Well, I said to the member that's a very good point, uh, and I'm sure he knows that the Health and Safety Executive have been quite proactive, also working with some of the employers and trade unions uh, in the LRA forum uh, to try and deal with some of the issues that have been brought forward. That LRA forum was a good sounding board when we were in the midst of COVID and trying to get people to come back uh, to work at that particular point in time. I think we do have good guidance at present. That guidance hasn't changed. Uh, but we can always revisit guidance in the light of where we are in particular circumstances. And of course, he will be delighted as I that Fermanagh and South Throne continues to be a compliant area. I call Palm Cameron. And can I ask if, if this debate is a debate on whether the glass is half full versus the glass is half empty in terms of the local restrictions? And does the First Minister agree with me that actually this is a way to live in a pandemic through COVID-19 by uh, introducing a, a, a restrictions which allow a balance for our economy to continue and also, for me, more importantly, for the health service to remain open or to reopen? 
So if I can remember, remind members why we intervened back in March, it was to uh, try and push down the curve and, and make sure that we didn't have the number of deaths that was being predicted at that time, but also to protect the NHS from being overwhelmed. And of course, there are concerns about that, Mr Speaker, at present, given that we're now entering the autumn-winter period with all of the usual, usual seasonal um, dysfunctions that happen during autumn and winter. So we're very conscious uh, of that. I agree with the member that the glass is half full. We are taking limited interventions. We are not closing down businesses. We're trying to say to people the evidence points to household spread. Therefore, we're asking you to work with us in all of these issues. And I know people can come up with all sorts of scenarios where they think that there are difficulties. Well, that's fair enough. But what we're trying to say to people is please, please use your common sense, work with us, try to stop the spread of COVID, and in that way we can control the spread. And don't forget, Northern Ireland, out of all the regions of the United Kingdom, is the best performing region when it comes to COVID, and let's make sure it stays there. I call Paul Catney. Mr. Speaker, uh, First Minister, um, I noticed that the Finance Committee, whenever we were talking, and our honourable member from Derry had stated that it was a two, this had fallen between two, that is the Department of Economy and Infrastructure. I wish to say that it fell between three because that was finance, and that question was asked in order to see where that's set, set with. But I wish to commend the Minister and the Deputy First Minister for at least bringing forward the regulations that that power would set with the economy will now be transferred to the Minister of Infrastructure, where we're used to delivery and things happening. Thank you. Well, to be, to be fair, uh, I think it is only fair that I say this, the power does not sit with the Department of the Economy. Um, uh, the uh, Minister for Infrastructure has argued that it doesn't sit for, with her. So what we have done is actually say you could use the financial assistance order, which is in place, I think, after the local government flooding, if I'm not uh, mistaken, sometime back in 2007. I think I was in the Minister for the Environment at the time when that financial assistance bill came through. So we're designating that department to take forward uh, the actions in relation to taxi and haulage. Nicole Meg Nesbitt. Mr Speaker, thank you. Uh, just to, to, to return to Sammy Wilson, um, I must say I, I find his party leader, let the odd elected rep go, is profoundly positive for, for party discipline. Uh, but my question to the First Minister is, has she any idea why did Sammy Wilson come to this apparently mistaken belief about what you were lobbying for around the executive table? Well, if I can point the member to some of the tweets that were put out by some of my executive colleagues, he may find the answer there. <laughs> and that concludes this item of business, and I would ask members to take your ease for a moment or two. Thank you.